Rob. <laughs> Less than a year ago, I was in a job that I couldn't stand anymore. I had spent the last six years working as a registered nurse in the intensive care unit. I cared for patients that had open heart surgeries, lung surgeries, heart attacks, kidney failure, and overdoses, among other critical ailments. When I first started the job, I was excited by all the medical treatment uh, training I'd get. But eventually, the emotional side of it all took its toll on me. I had hundreds of hours of training in the technical aspects of critical care and emergency nursing. But what people never taught me was how to deal with the emotional aspects of the care I provided. I saw death and dying, pain and suffering on the faces of my patients and their families on a daily basis. I began to question the ethics of keeping people alive in critical states, knowing they would die days or weeks later. It got to the point where I was no longer effective as a nurse or as a person because I didn't care anymore. Emotionally, I couldn't care anymore. It affected my work life. It affected my home life. Critical incidences at work would haunt me. They would keep me up at all hours of the night, wondering what I could have done differently for a better outcome. I crashed, and I crashed hard. It wasn't the work that caused this, but the way I dealt with the work. By July, I quit my job without another one lined up. I was torn, I was tattered, I was crushed. You could say I was completely and utterly burnt. Hey, 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 hey. Open flames. Are you serious? I'm in the middle of a monologue here and you're... Sorry. You know the deal. We're not supposed to... Sorry. I'll do it a different way. You could say I was completely and utterly burnt out. However, on the other side of this experience, I came out a little worse for wear, a little singed, but I was whole again because I learned something new about caring. What led to my burnout, what, one of the major effects that led to my burnout, was the way I provided care. When I, as a nurse, I was told to keep a therapeutic distance from my patients so I wouldn't become emotionally involved with them. I wouldn't become hurt when they worsened or died. I was told to remove myself from the family dynamics of the situation as well. This model of caring set me up to care for my patients physically and little more, but I felt empty. I felt I got nothing in return. I cared for my patients and they took the care. This is the predominant model of caring seen in hospitals today. It leads to high levels of burnout and it's not uncommon for nurses to change units or hospitals every few years because of it. It's as if they're trying to find meaning to their career and to themselves. But what they don't realize and what I didn't realize is the meaning is already there. This is what I learned about caring. What precipitated this learning was reading an essay by Dr. Susan Parenti. In her essay, Redesigning the Character of the Care Actor, she idealistically suggests how to change healthcare to be more caring and less corporate. She discusses the interaction between patients and nurses as having bi-directional care. She describes this bi-directional care as care moving in two directions, that while the caregiver offers something to the patient, the patient in return offers something to the caregiver. This is where she finished and where I began. I believe bi-directional care occurs when a nurse cares for a patient, not just physically, but truly cares for a patient on an emotional, psychological, and or spiritual level. When a nurse is able to allow themselves to go beyond their basic job description and care for a patient, the patient becomes fulfilled. And the nurse feels fulfilled 
because they were able to care for somebody else. And more often than not, the patient will care for the caregiver in a different way. This gives meaning to the patient. It gives meaning to the nurse, and it also gives meaning to the nurse-patient relationship. It's no longer a contractual agreement between a patient and a hospital. It's important to note that we don't care for patients to get cared for in return. That's a byproduct of caring. We care for people because we are human. I believe to truly care for someone, you have to spend time with them and be able to have a genuine interest in them. If I take the time to be present with my patients, I learn about their likes, I learn about their dislikes, I learn about their family history. All the while, I'm able to garner medical information about them. You don't have to know someone's inner darkest secrets or know their uh, emotional turmoil to care for them, even though you might learn this about them. The key about caring is to be able to share of yourself to another person and have them share for you in return. Since transitioning out of the intensive care unit, I've become a home health nurse, a cardiac home health nurse. So I now visit patients in their homes to assess their medical problems. Although I'm there for a medical assessment, I make it a focus of mine to sit there and talk to them and learn about them. And it becomes more of a relationship than a job. Since changing this, this model of caring that I have, I've been able to care for my patients in many different ways than I'd never used to. I was able to have a genuine conversation with a 91-year-old woman who didn't want to be revived if she was to stop breathing. I was able to console a World War II veteran who fought in Northern Africa because he was crying over the men he lost there. I've been able to hug a woman who was crying because her daughter died of cancer just a few months before. I've even gotten down on my hands and knees to replace a Wi-Fi con uh, console because the patient had switched companies and didn't have Wi-Fi. What's life without Wi-Fi? <laughs> and it's those things that I'm able to do for other people to make them feel special. And I've been cared for differently since I've changed my model of caring. I've had a patient find my personal address and send me something in the mail, cookies for Christmas. I had another patient who finished baking a batch of cookies right out of the oven, 10 cup cookies, 10 cups of different things in there, directly warm out of the oven. You're seeing a common theme here, I, I like cookies. <laughs> That's not a joke. Um, I've had people give me gift cards for Christmas, things like that. I've had a patient who had a stroke and lost the right uh, side of his uh, body. He wasn't able to move it. He took me into his garage and showed me the model train uh, setup that he was building. He was climbing underneath the table and drilling with his left hand, which he had never done before, to run, uh, run wiring underneath to make it all work. Not only did I feel cared for, but it was awe-inspiring and inspiring. Now you, you might ask, why do I care about caring so much? It's not just because about the burnout that I had. That's a part of it. The original reason why I became a nurse was because of my grandmother, Veronica Ultramat. She and my grandfather raised me from the time I was five years old after my mother passed away. And I knew them as Ma and Pa. At the age of 22, I was at the crossroads in my life trying to figure out whether I wanted to be a paramedic or a nurse. I was already working on ambulances in San Diego. About the same time, my grandmother was diagnosed with terminal cancer, and she was placed on home hospice uh, care. A nurse would be coming out to our home once a week to check her status and see how she was doing. Our nurse was Nurse Mary. Nurse Mary would come to our home once or twice a week and check on my grandmother. But before she did anything else, she would sit down and talk to my grandmother. They would just talk for about a half hour about life, about where they were from, about raising kids and things like that. 
they'd finally get around to talking about the medical issues at hand, but they, they laughed. There was some crying sometimes because death was coming, but they laughed a lot. One memory just sticks with me so much. I can vividly remember Nurse Mary bringing my grandfather and I around my grandmother's hospital bed that was set up in our den. And she told us that my grandmother would not live much longer. She facilitated my grandfather and I telling my grandmother that we were heartbroken and that we loved her. And we, it was okay for her to die. And we were able to give her permission to go. She died a short time later and I never saw Nurse Mary again. But the caring that she provided my family in our time of sorrow was so dramatic that it affirmed my decision to become a nurse. I know now that she used bi-directional care without having a name for it. That's just who she was and what she did. And it was my burnout just last year that caused me to come full circle to realize that bi-directional care was what brought me into nursing and was what I needed to become a viable, effective, caring person again. And you may be saying, well, that's great. That's great for nurses. But I truly believe that bi-directional care can be applied to any situation, whatever have you. For example, let's take a business example. If a barista at the coffee shop takes an interest in their customer and remembers something that's important to them, whether it's they have dogs, or they like skiing, or they swallow swords for some reason. <laughs> I don't know. But if the barista, the next time he sees that customer, brings up that important matter, whatever you has it, the customer feels important. They feel cared for. And the barista feels important because they were able to care for somebody else. And quite often that customer will go ahead and care for the barista in return in the form of a tip, in the form of a joke, or maybe even a smile. That relationship is no longer about the buying and selling of coffee, it's about life. It brings meaning to both of them. And it's important to note that because the, patient, the, the customer and the barista now have a relationship, that customer is more than likely to go back to that coffee shop because it's not about good coffee. It might be about bad coffee, who knows? Now, many of you may be saying, well, Rob, I don't want to get emotionally involved with a lot of people. I don't care. But you know what I say to you? There's an emotionally safe way that you can open up an avenue to caring for other people. It's something that we see here every week, off and on. It's the use of art. Everybody has an art form that they like, whether it's twirling a stick, hula hoop, juggling, clowning, uh, crocheting, cooking, sword swallowing, whatever have you. I don't mean to pick on you. <laughs> but whatever have you, there's an art form that if you are able to physically intertwine that with another person, that actually opens that avenue to say, hey, I care enough for you to show you my art. Whether it's a little doodle, whether it's a drawing, a painting, a poem, a song, or playing an instrument. It's that important to them. Something I used to do in the hospital that I, I really, I knew what I was doing, but I didn't know the ramifications of it, is our patients that had uh, heart surgery would get a little pillow to put on their chest. It was actually a towel wrapped in a, in a uh, pillowcase. But I would take it and I would take a Sharpie marker, marker and I'd draw the only cartoon face I knew how to and I would name it their best friend. It would be their best friend for the next week or two. And they'd hold it against their chest. Whether they had a great sense of humor or they were the crabbiest old man you ever seen, if they had this happy little face hold, held to their chest while they're getting up and walking around the unit, that really created, started to create something open for us. Whether I helped them for 10 minutes or a couple of days, they knew, hey, that's the guy that drew a silly face in my pillow. And we were able to talk about whatever, and that was opened up that dialogue, and that was very important to me. So now that we've talked about art, talked about bi-directional care, I'd like to show you an illustration 
of both at the same time. We'll go here to the table. Each and every one of us has an emotional bucket, if you will. Those were supposed to pop out, by the way. <laughs> and we have the ability to have caring acts for other people. As we go about our day, as we go about our day, we meet other people. And we are able to do caring things for them. We can talk to them. We can sing them a song. We can even give them a hug if they need it. We know that we've done something caring for them because we've done the acts of caring for them. And we start to fill their bucket. The one thing that we don't always realize is as we care for other people, it opens the avenue for others to care for us all at the same time. The more and more we care about people, the more it becomes second nature, just like breathing. We can tell them a joke. We can do a magic trick for them. We can even just smile at them. And we begin to start to overflow their bucket. And we know that because we've done those caring acts for them. The one thing that's really important to know is just because we have a preferred method of caring, such as talking to them or spending time with them, other people may have a different method of caring for us. They may like to bake us something. They may like to do something completely and utterly different. And that's something that I've realized is when something does something, somebody does something that's out of the ordinary for you, it is extraordinary. The one thing that we have a problem with is as we go about our day, we are always having issues. We're always running around trying to get our to-do list done. We are always on our cell phone instead of looking at the face of other people. We believe that our to-do list is the thing that's most important to us. But what we realize, need to realize, is it's other people and caring is. Because at the end of the day, we've cared for absolutely nobody at all. <laughs> and we end up empty as well. And the big thing to realize is just because we think something as small and insignificant as a red ball, that it isn't insignificant to another person. It can actually have the opportunity to be a huge deal to them. The more that we care about these people, the more that we start to completely overflow them. And you know, at the same time, just because we overflow them, they start to overflow our buckets too. So I leave you with this tonight, as you go home and back to your family and friends. When you care for others, magic happens.